Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Lord. We worship and honor you tonight, Father. You know, in the scriptures we see where the, the prophet would say, the hand of the Lord came upon me, and the hand of the Lord came upon so-and-so. I don't know what this all means. All I know is just that the Lord wants, that that's what's going to happen. I'll say it that way here tonight. The hand of the Lord is going to come upon us tonight what that means how that all comes about I don't know but I just know that when the hand of the Lord comes what that's symbolic of is the anointing of God God putting his hand to action God causing something to come on us that causes something to happen to us and something to come through us that's purely of him and not of us and so Lord we agree we receive the hand of the Lord upon this service tonight we're not going to try to figure that out or formulate it or fix it in our own mind. But God, we yield to the hand of the Lord tonight. We know the hand of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for the hand of the Lord tonight. We thank you for the hand of the Lord. God, let your blood, let the blood of Jesus and the oil of the Holy Ghost be upon our ears. Let it be upon our, our hands, upon our feet tonight. Let the anointing of God cause us to hear. Let the blood purge our thoughts so that we can hear what the Spirit is saying, not what man is saying. We thank you, Father, that you help us to put our hand to the task that you've given us and that your anointing and your blood is working through our hands. Your anointing and your blood is working on our feet to lead us down the pathway that you have for us. We thank you, Father, that you are doing exceeding abundantly beyond what we can even ask or think. These things are mysteries to us, but they're divine wisdom coming from the Holy Spirit. And so tonight, like Gideon's army and Gideon himself, we yield to you, Father, because we know you want to do something great through few. You want to take a few and do something powerful in this earth. And so we present ourselves tonight as arm, the army of the Lord. And I thank you, Lord. Just like you spoke to me a few months ago and you said, welcome to Gideon's army. I thank you that in this room tonight, maybe online tonight, Gideon's army is represented in the spirit here tonight. And so, Father, I thank you that you rout the enemies through the army, the army that you are raising up. The enemies that would come against your people, against the nation, against uh, the world, against your plan in these last days. I thank you for the anointing that was upon Gideon and upon his army to be mighty men and women of valor, mighty people of valor in Jesus' name. I say that's who in this, is in this room tonight. And I pray, God, you'll help us to quit seeing ourselves through the lies of the devil. You'll help us to quit seeing ourselves in our own opinions. You'll help us to quit defining ourselves by our, our past mistakes or successes. But, God, you will help us to see us as you see us. Like you told Harold this morning, this is how I see you. I don't see you crawling along. I don't see you stumbling. I don't see you defeated. I see you standing, hallelujah, standing in my grace, standing in my ability, standing in my power, moving with me. Oh, hallelujah. So we answer the call. When the angel appeared to Gideon and said, Hail, mighty man of valor, he didn't know he was a mighty man of valor. But you knew he was. And so tonight we answer the call because there's a soldier that lives in us and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a victor. <laughs> there's a greater one than what's in this world. A greater one than he who is in this world that lives in us. And we yield to him tonight. We thank you that you enable us to fight the good fight. To overcome, to stand in victory in the land. Seeing your will fulfilled. Even your purpose and your plan. In the name of Jesus. We answer the call tonight. We answer the call tonight. 
We thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah. Just give him praise tonight. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. We worship you tonight. We worship you tonight, Lord. Dobra mi kendo rebeketa. Velebe kom rafi stando te velite me shisha la bokra mi kendo vele kene manda. Oh, we give you praise, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you all the credit. <laughs> we give you all the praise. We answer. We answer the call. In you, we will stand tall. Yes. We praise you. We worship you tonight, Lord. Captain. Captain of the armies of the Lord. Captain of the host. We give you praise tonight. Hallelujah. We follow you in the battle tonight. We follow you. Oh, hallelujah. The angel with the drawn sword. We follow you tonight. We follow you tonight. Speak to us, Lord, as you spoke to Joshua of old. Speak to your people. Show them what to do. Show us what to do, Lord, as we go, as we follow you. Yes. Just give him praise tonight. my king we answer the call of the king tonight you are my king you are my king you are my king You are my king. You are my king. Kings provide and they protect. You are my king. And they lead you into battle to victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Well, give him praise one more time tonight before you're seated. We praise you, Lord. We praise you and honor you. Hallelujah. We shout unto God with a voice of triumph. We thank you for who you are in our lives. And we bless you in this place. Angels being sent forth. Oh, yes. Glory to God. The swirl of your whirlwind, your angelic whirlwind. We thank you for it, Lord. We praise you for it, Lord. There's a lot of activity in the realm of the Spirit these days. A lot of activity, a lot of activity. There are gazillions of angels that have been released from heaven into this earth realm for this day and this hour to perform the will of God. And uh, I'm just telling you, I, I saw it tonight, the angels of God. 
the seraphim angels, the fiery angels. Just a whirlwind of fire moving. Praise God. And that's, it's here in this place. They're here. They're here to hear what God has to say because they hearken to the voice of his word. And so, Father, we honor your angels here tonight. Help us to cooperate with them. Help them to cooperate with us as we flow with you tonight in the prophetic word of the Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Amen. We'll say hi to someone. Tell them you love them. Prophesy to them. Do something. Amen? Just be a blessing. Hallelujah. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise God. If you need an offering envelope, just lift your hands. Hallelujah. I, uh, yesterday I was, um, God always gives me scriptures, not always, but whenever he has me pray about government situations, he always gives me scripture verses or chapters or things to declare and uh, uh, read, but I'm not going to talk about government. I'm just in, kind of introducing why I was here in uh, chapter 10 of Psalms. And uh, as I read through that and I prayed into that, into that chapter uh, concerning governments, um, I came to the very last verse. And um, when, let me say this, before he gave, me, uh, he gave me this chapter, he said verse chapter 10 of Psalms. And I said, chapter 10 of Psalms. And he says, yeah, he says, you've entered into a 10-year cycle. Uh, concerning government and uh, a 10-year cycle is a judgment and a justice cycle so you so you uh, so there's judgment that takes place but the end result is is justice and so that's the cycle it starts out with judgment and ends with justice and uh, so I was praying into that and I came to verse 18 and, you know, this isn't really a, a, an offering scripture or a scripture even you want to memorize. <laughs> but, but there was a phrase that caught my attention. He began to teach me about this phrase. And here in verse 18, it says, to do justice. See, and that, it ends in justice. The, you know, the last scripture, you know, ends in justice. And it's, I mean, it ends in justice, not injustice, but injustice. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm digging it deeper. It says, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. And so, you know, that doesn't really sound like an offering scripture or, again, something you want to even memorize. But the phrase to do justice, that word to do justice is vindicate. He's actually, God is going to vindicate the just. That's why it also says the wealth of the wicked is going to come into the hands of the just. God looks at the wealth of the wicked. They've done wicked things with their finances. They've done wicked things with their life and to people. You know, they're, they're, a lot of times they're the men who oppress. And, and God looks at that, the wicked rich man, not the rich man. Not, God's not against riches. <laughs> you know, he, just, uh, he wants you to have riches. He doesn't want riches to have you. And, and so... He, he looks at that man, it's like the man over in, I think it is in Luke, that says, um, oh, look, I've planted all these crops, and I've reaped this great harvest, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull down my old barns, and I'm going to build new barns, and I'm going to party, and I'm just going to live my life. And God, God's response to him, you're a fool. Why? Because he didn't ask God what to do with his riches. He didn't ask God to, what to do with his abundance. He just assumed he was going to. He didn't even acknowledge God. And the Bible says the definition of a fool is a, is a person who doesn't believe there's a God or acts like they believe there's a God. And so, so he says here to do justice means to vindicate. He's going to vindicate. The word oppressed, to, he says he's going to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that word oppressed means, uh, means unjust. It means hardship because of unjust exercise of authority. See, the devil can oppress you. He can oppress your mind. He can oppress your finances. He can oppress all kinds of things. He can take unjust exercise of authority, and he can persecute you. He can traumatize you. He can keep you down. But God says right here, 
or David says of God, that God is going to come to do justice, vindicate. We're in a time of vindication. We're in a time where God says, I've had enough of the devil uh, um, hindering and, and uh, hindering your dreams, the dreams that God has given you, the desires that God has put in you, the ministries God's put in you, uh, the places and things and people, and all that God has ordained for your life. And the devil has been able to hold back. God says this is a 10-year cycle. We've entered into a 10-year cycle where he's going to do judgment, the king of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, he will judge rightly. And, and so there's a, there's a season now that we're in that there's, because we've judged ourselves. The Bible says if you judge yourself, you'll not be judged. You'll not come under judgment. And I believe we are a people who have judged our hearts. We've let God change our attitudes. We've let God change our thinking in many cases. And, and, and I believe that God has come now to vindicate his people. And so I just want to encourage you. Like I said, it's not a scripture you may want to memorize or, you know, you know shout over or whatever. Well, you should be shouting over it, praise God, because God has come to do justice. He's come to make things right and to vindicate uh, and, and to turn things around in our life. He told me at the first of the year that this is a year of breakthrough to break out. It's a year of breakthrough to break out. And so I just want to encourage you, just keep moving on with God. Just keep looking to him. Just keep, begin to speak into those dreams. Begin to speak into those desires. Begin to speak into those things that God has talked to you and prophesied to you about. And, and pray into them because we're entering a time that God's going to judge our enemies. And people aren't your enemies. You know, the devil and all of his goons are our enemies. And the, and the things that he's, he's tried to work against us, his plots and his plans, they are our enemies. And I'm telling you, God, if I could put it kind of like my mom, I'm up to here with you right now. <laughs> you know, we as moms sometimes, I'm up to here with you right now. And, uh, and that's the way, I think that's, that's the way God's heart is right now that it's time for us to have the harvest. It's time for us to have the things that God has promised us and said to us and assured us in. And so he's coming with judgment to bring us justice. So I just wanted to encourage you with that tonight and know that God, like Pastor said, God is doing it. God is doing it. Whatever he's told you he's going to do, he is doing it. Amen? And, if he, and, and, and just one more thing real quick. When the Lord spoke to me here a while back, when I, I went before the Lord and I said, you're the judge of all the earth, and God and I just began to plead my case concerning a, a financial situation, and, uh, and I, I just saw in my spirit God's, ha God's uh, the hammer, whatever, the mallet, whatever, gavel, that's it, <laughs> come down, and when it came down, he said, he, he pointed to the devil and he says, he must repay, take him away. And I saw the angels dragging him away. So I'm telling you, justice is coming to the body of Christ. It may be vindication and judgment to the devil and anybody that wants to hook up with him, but justice is coming for the body of Christ. Amen? Take your tithe and offering in your hand. Father, we thank you and we praise you tonight for all that you're doing. We thank you that you are a just God and that you are our king and you will provide and you will protect. And God, you are the, you are the father of the fatherless and the deliverer of the oppressed. And Father God, I thank you that you are vindicating your people in this earth. And Father, we praise you and we thank you for that. So we honor you, sir, tonight in our giving. We thank you that because we give, it shall be given unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto us. And we bless you and we honor you, sir, in Jesus' name, amen.
Yes, we do thank you, Father. You are a good Father. You're better than we even understand. Throughout eternity, we're going to discover how good you really are. So tonight we offer this offering to you and we worship you and we thank you, Father, that you are a good Father and you are a just God. Let this offering be a blessing to people all over this world as it goes forth for the, the gospel and the kingdom. And I thank you that your people are blessed, Father, to walk in the fullness of what you have for them to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good stuff, Ron. Appreciate that, man. Praise God. Amen. Well, glory. Grab your Bible and turn over to Psalm 110. Karen was in Psalm 10. Didn't dawn on me until she was talking, because she had told me a little bit about here a while back about the Psalm 10 thing that God was show, uh, sharing with her. It didn't dawn on me until she was up here just speaking how that last week the Lord had dealt with me about Psalm 110. I don't think that means I'm 100 points better than Karen or anything, but... Uh, but this is a, uh, it's interesting with the tens. It was 2010 that the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, you, under, you know me as your father, you know me as your healer, you know me as this, you know me as that. But he said, you don't know me very well as king. And he said, I'm shifting into a king mode in these last days. You know, as, as you begin to pu push into another um, season, in the earth, a spiritual season, as you begin to come into a time. And, of course, as we read the book of Revelation, we see that Jesus is coming back on a horse. Uh, the Jews never rode a horse unless they were getting ready to fight a battle. They used their horses for battle. It's kind of like we drive our cars, but we use army tanks for war, right? Well, they rode donkeys around and walked and rode in carts. But when it was time for war, they used horses mainly. They did use camels, and they did use mules and this and that too, but primarily they used horses. And we see in Revelation where Jesus is coming back, and he's dressed for battle, and he's uh, coming back to take complete possession, set up his kingdom on the earth. So we're, we're moving into that time. We're moving toward that millennial reign time that he's going to be ruling and reigning. And it's going to be a hostile takeover. It's not going to be... And not everybody on earth is going to be glad to see Jesus show up. Amen? The Bible even tells us uh, in different prophetic scriptures about the last days that there will be nations, there will be sheep nations and goat nations, there will be nations that refuse to worship him and, and drought will come on the nation. There will be no rain, it says, if they don't come up and worship during that millennial rain time. But... The point being this, is that we're shifting into that time and Jesus is beginning to move that way in the earth to, uh, he's, he's going to, you know, the enemy always shows up at harvest time. If you read the Old Testament, the enemies of Israel would lay back, let the Jews grow their crops, let them do all the work, and then when it came time for harvest, they'd invade and try to either to kill the people or run them off and steal their harvest. Well, it is harvest time in the earth, and the enemy has come in our generation to try to back us off so he can keep us from having our harvest. But we're not, gonna, we're not going to lose our harvest. That spirit, that spirit that was on Gideon to stand up in harvest time. And there was another Jewish man, I can't remember his name right now, but he had a pea patch. He had a, a big uh, field of lentils. And the enemy started coming at him and he just said, they're not getting my pea patch. He pulled out, who was it? Shama was it? Was that his name? I, I, was it? Oh, well, it was somebody. <laughs> and he just, he stood his ground by himself and defeated the enemy. And so that spirit is, God's wanting that spirit to come on the church like was on Gideon and on Joshua and, you know, to, to make war. You know, we hear a lot about holy war. Uh, today, you know, from an a, uh, uh, Islamic perspective, radical Islamic perspective, well, there is a holy war. Jesus doesn't fight an unholy war. He fights a war for the right purposes. And uh, so anyway, uh, back in 2010, he started teaching me about him and about his angel armies. He started teaching me about him as 
you know, one of his names, of course, names in the Bible has to do with who you are, you know, your calling, who you are, the, the essence of your being. And one of his names is Lord of Hosts, which is Jehovah Sabaoth, which basically means Lord of Armies. Yes. He's the Lord of Armies. And his army, when you study that all out, his army is everything he's ever created and everybody uh, that he's created that will fight with him. Yeah. Angels, hailstones, whatever. He uses it all as his army. But here in Psalm 110, it says, let's read the verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies my, thy footstool. That's qu quoted over in Hebrews in the revelation of Jesus when he rose from the dead and he went into heaven and he was given a position at the right hand of the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords. He became our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek and Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Amen? Amen. So he's a king, but he also has that priesthood on our behalf. But notice it says here, the Father says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. In other words, you have won the, the legal victory uh, in the redemption and in the atonement of your blood, and now I'm going to enforce that in the earth. Yeah. And eventually, I'm going to put every one of your enemies under your feet. They are going to not just legally be under your feet, they are going to be vitally under your feet. And the Bible says the last enemy that will be put underfoot is death itself. The Lord, verse 2, the Lord shall send the rod, that word rod, uh, actually, uh, it, it has a connotation of a tribe or, a, you know, a family lineage. Like a family tree, the trunk of a family tree. The Lord shall send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So he's basically talking about the lineage of Jesus and him coming up out of Zion and coming up out of, of the Jews to rule in the midst of his enemies. And that's what he did, didn't he? When he was here on this earth, he ruled in the midst of his enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. In the, in the day of your power, your people shall be willing. That's us. Yes. We're going to be willing because it's, it's a day of power and a day of authority. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have, you have the dew of your, of your youth. He's talking about there's a day. You know, it's like a day is born, the sun comes up, the beauty of the holiness. There's a day that's going to be birthed forth where the people of God are going to be willing and ready to go, just like Gideon, just like Joshua, just like those people of old, are going to go forth with him in this, this spiritual war, if you want to call it that, in this taking bath. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. See, that's speaking of the, the spiritual heads that are ruling men through deception. He's going to, the Bible says he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. He's going to bring those down, and we're starting to see some of those things fall even now. And you'll see the, their puppet leaders fall too. You're going to see govern, governing people in this earth who are bent on evil, some of them are even going to fall dead, just like Herod did when they praised him as a god and he didn't give God the glory. It's, they said that he was eight of worms and fell over dead. We're in that kind of a time. Verse 7, he shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. The lifting up of the head has a connotation of making war, of lifting up your head. So anyway, God uh, had been dealing with me about this psalm, bringing me back to it a few times the last week or two. And just kind of reminding me of this is the, the hour and the day that we're in, that he has come to take back what belongs to him. In the, in the midst of that, or in the, as, uh, as I was fellowshipping with him over the last week or so, he spoke to me at one point, and that's where this message comes out of. It actually is kind of part two of what I preached the last time I preached on Sunday night. If you weren't here, we, we talked about uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, where it talks about putting on the armor of God which is prayer armor to, to you know, protect yourself with the truth of the word because the enemy is going to start taking shots at you if you actually pray. Yep. You know, some people play, others pray. Right. God's, God, when you get serious and you start praying, when you start 
watching in the Spirit and listening to the Holy Spirit and praying for other Christians and praying for the church and actually taking ground, the enemy's going to start taking shots at you when you do that. But the Bible says we can protect ourselves with the armor of God. And so I talked about that and how we're in a time right now where it's very ne necessary for us to pray one for another. You know, an uh, army only wins when they move as a unit together. Yeah. That's why in boot camp they take all of that, you're doing your own thing on your own out of you. Yeah. And they, they put into you that you learn to move on a command because the, everything is designed where everybody moves together in order to have victory. You start doing your own thing, you'll get you killed and maybe other people killed too. So <clears throat> we have to come to that kind of a mindset. And that's part of what the Lord began to teach me in 2010 was get rid of this, this uh, just being a civilian, you know, person or being a, a refugee of war type thing, running from the devil or whatever, and step up and find out how you're connected with everybody else and move together with a army with a with a warfare mentality, yeah. amen, as a unit together. And so we talked a little bit about that the last time I ministered, and at one point right after that. The Lord spoke to me, and he said this to me, because we had talked about the sword of the Spirit over there in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. He spoke to me, and he said this to me one morning. He said, continue to wield the sword. Continue to wield the sword. Now, this was at a time when I had heard a bunch of stuff about what the enemy was trying to do to offset what God's doing in our nation and all that, you know, the discouraging things that come or the the enemy trying to create fear uh, or whatever. And the Lord just said, you continue to wield the sword. The word wield, the word uh, W-I-E-L-D, wield, is, uh, the, the definition is to hold and use a weapon or tool. To hold and use a weapon or a tool. Continue to wield the sword, he said to me. Let's look at some scriptures, just... Uh, kind of go over some scriptures that have, that give us this revelation of our weapon. Of course, Ephesians, or Hebrews 4.12 talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is what? Sharp than a two-edged sword. It's the sword, well, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, but I'll tell you what, let's just, let's just take some time and turn to all of these and read them for ourselves. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, to the joints and marrow of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is interesting. The word two-edged here means, in the Greek means two-mouthed. God's sword works that way. God speaks out of his mouth. He expects you to yield and let his word come to you and speak it out of your mouth. Yeah. Because it doesn't do any good in the earth until it's released into the earth. Yeah. You know, one reason the, de the devil always, if you read the Old Testament and you, and you study history, the devil was always after the prophets. He was always trying to take the prophets out. He was always trying to discredit the prophets. And usually it's because the prophets told the truth. If the king was wicked and evil and on the wrong track, they would say, thus saith the Lord, get your act together or you're going to end up dead and you're going to mess this nation all up. Well, evil people don't like to hear truth. Rebellious people don't like to hear truth. Now, I know where to speak the truth with the motive of love, but sometimes truth is harder. There's a song on Christian radio right now that talks about how it's, it's easier to live in deception than it is to accept truth sometimes. And, and that's true for all of us, right? And in saying that, God's not condemning us, but he's bringing us into a place where he, we can be blessed and we can uh, have what he has for us. But here it says that the, the word of God is a two-mouthed sword. And I love what it says here. It says, piercing even to the dividing asunder between soul and spirit. The word of God will separate what's you in your mind and your soul and what is God and his spirit. Amen? Our biggest problem in life is us trying to figure God out. Yeah. And trying to, you know, come up with a plan for God to bless. If we'll just learn that it's when we're weak that we become strong. If, if we just would learn 
that we, we need to come to him as a little child. That doesn't mean we don't grow up spiritually, mature, and learn, and, and all of those things. But in your daily walk, you need to be, present yourself as a little child and let him talk to you and lead you. Let him do what he wants to do. Come to him, be honest. Well, his word will come, and his word will... See, like when he spoke to me about keep wielding the sword, what he was telling me is don't let this stuff get in your mind and you start using your sword, the sword of your spirit, the sword of your mouth in a wrong way. Right. Amen? Amen? Right. I didn't know I needed to hear, hear uh, keep wielding the sword, but he knew I needed to hear it. Right. So I just, I become a blank slate before him on purpose. If he hasn't told me what to preach when I come to church, I show up with no agenda, no message, Amen. no plans, except a basic format to come together and worship God. And then here we are, Lord. It's like Bobby Connor. I heard him talk about the first miracle service he did. They got this meeting all put together, and all of just this big building of people showed up in this, this auditorium somewhere there in Texas where he was living. And he said he peeked around the curtain before the meeting was starting. He says, here's all these people out there. None of them, he said, none of them look like Christians. And he said, and they're all sitting there like this. And he said, I thought, oh, God. You know, he says, God, what, what, you know, what are we going to do here? And God says, you ain't going to do anything unless I show up. So you just better know that right now. He said, you're going to be nothing but embarrassed unless I show up today. And basically what the Lord was telling him is just back away from this care and, and all that. And you just trust me and you listen to me and it'll work out. And he said they had a wild old Holy Ghost time happen there. He said many people were healed and blessed. So the word of God will discern us. That's why we ask God for scriptures. Amen. And it's the sword of the spirit. Let's turn to another, another one, <laughs> another. Let's turn over to another. Uh, let's go over to Revelation. I like this one. Revelation chapter one. Yeah, another and just like the other and. Revelation chapter one. This is where Jesus appeared to John. Look at verse sixteen. It says. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Jesus, now this is the resurrected in heaven Jesus. This is the Jesus that's in you and that is in heaven right now ruling and reigning. This is him in his glorified high priestly kingly state amen as the head of the church but notice it says out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and we know of course here in revelation as well it says that when he returns on that horse that white horse and he comes into there's a sword coming out of his mouth what's the what's the picture here We're, the lord is trying to get us to see that our mouth his mouth is a sword. Your words are swords of the Spirit. You are designed to war a warfare with your mouth. That's why, the devil, that's why there's so much teaching about words in the Bible. There's so much emphasis on that. The devil wants to take control of the weapon in, in, in your mouth yeah. and use it for his purposes. Yeah. Come on, are you here? Yeah. Amen. Amen me now and then just so I know you haven't fallen asleep. Amen. Yeah. So Jesus... The Jesus that lives in me has a weapon in his mouth, a sword in his mouth, and he wants me to understand the same. Look over at Proverbs uh, chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. <coughs> Verse 18. This is a, a kind of a negative take on this. Speaking of evil people. Uh, look at verse 17. It says, He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. So it's somebody using their mouth in a right way and a wrong way. Look at verse 18. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You know, the sword of the Lord is kind of like a scalpel. A, a doctor uses a sharp instrument to cut away cancer, to cut away disease. Amen to fix the situation. But it says here that there's a person that speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. 
You and I can use that sword like a surgeon. Yes. When the enemy comes against us, we can cut away the evil. Yes. We can cut off the enemy yes. by the sword of the Lord that's in our mouth. Amen? Yes. Praise God. Look at uh, Psalm 64. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Psalm 64, verse 3. Uh, let me just start verse 1. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Notice what he's saying here. He's not saying preserve my life. He said preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Right. Get me out of the spirit of fear. Yeah. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet or sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. So we see how, you know, our mouth can be a weapon for good or a weapon for evil. Yes. Now, we're in a time right now, we're in a spiritual season where the fight is on, the war is on. Yes. God has taken great, well, how can I say it? He, he's emphasized to me much in my walk with him over the last year of the fact that we are in, we, the battle has been engaged. Yes. You know, this, in the Hebrew, this is uh, the year 5777. And when you look it up, you look those numbers up in the Hebrew and the letters they stand for, it's a crowned sword. Yes. It's the year of the sword of the Lord. It's the year of the clashing of swords. Uh, we've never seen in our, at least in my time, so many people through the internet, on TV, just in, in, in general and public, so much talking, attacking, accusation, coming against. What is that? It's the year of the clashing of the swords. It's the year where God has already decreed the freedom of, of and turning our nation back. What this is about is our nation is going back to its godly foundations. God is removing evil from the land. He is dealing with us, removing evil out of our life, anything that the enemy would use to deceive us, to hold us in bondage. He's setting us free in our jubilee year so that we can return to our inheritance. We can return and, and connect with our spiritual heritage and go forward and have the fullness of our inheritance. And he told me that on my 65th birthday, my life would change. I would shift into the fullness of the purpose he put me on this earth and what he showed me that purpose was, he's given me the honor to live in a time to be a part of shifting this nation, turning this great ship around called America that's headed in the wrong direction, back in the direction it needs to go so that the future generations until Jesus come can live on a, a true and a sure foundation. I like what Lance Walla now says. He said, God, this last election, he stuck his foot in the door. The enemy was trying to close the door on this nation, take us into a one-world government thing in a premature way. That is going to happen eventually, but it's not. The devil's always trying to control the seasons. God says, no. Now, this, I'm not talking about a Republican-Democrat thing here because there are evil Republicans and there are righteous Republicans. There are evil Democrats and there are righteous Democrats. I'm talking about God searching the hearts of people, even the church, because the Bible says that judgment's coming to the house of God first. He's going to talk to us about us and he's going to get anything out of us that the enemy's going to be able to use to hold us in bondage to keep us from going on and being the glorious church. So it's not a throwing rocks at each other in some way. Now, we have to discern, you know, who's talking, what they're saying, and if it's worth listening to, and what we're in agreement with, of course. But this is about the time where God said, I'm pulling my sword out. Amen. There are times when God pulls out his sword. Remember Joshua? When it was time to take the land, the, the captain of the host of the Lord, and a lot of Bible scholars believe that was Jesus himself and his pre-incarnate uh, being, and had I, I, myself, I think it was probably... Uh, uh, Michael, Michael the archangel, he appeared to, to, uh, to Joshua, pulled his sword out. He was standing there with his sword ready, looking at him. And Joshua says, you know, are you for us or for our enemies? He said, no. 
but as captain of the armies of the Lord am I now come. I'm with him and what he's, his purpose is. Who are you with, Joshua? And Joshua got it because he fell on his face and said, what do you have to say to me? I'll do whatever you say. And so when Joshua engaged in the directions of God given him, he had his burning bush mo moment like Moses had had his in the generation before, and he began to do what God told him to do. And God told him, keep your mouth shut, don't speak your own words, because you'll be tempted to say the wrong thing. You'll be tempted to say, big walls, big giants, how are we ever going to overcome this? He said, keep your mouth shut. Just blow the trumpets as you march around. March like an army. March like you're going somewhere to have victory. Blow the trumpets and, you know, let that happen. Let that decree in the spirit realm. And then that last time around on the seventh day, the seventh time, you are to blow a trumpet called the Yovel. That sound of the trumpet, when you study it in there, was different than the other blasts of the trumpet. It was the Jubilee trumpet. It was decreeing freedom. It was decreeing a moment of freedom, and then the people shouted for that freedom, the shout of a king going to war. And when they did that, the enemy's kingdom fell down. And then they used the natural sword and went in and took Jericho. That's the kind of season we're in. Hallelujah. The Bible doesn't tell us to fight any fight but the good fight of faith. I figured out a long time ago what a good fight was. That's one you win. If you've ever lost one, you know that wasn't a good fight. But Jesus has fought for us, and he's giving us the opportunity of following him in. Praise God. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, yeah, there are going to be people out there. Their words are going to be piercing like a sword. They're going to use their sword in the wrong way. But we can't be one of them. Here the other day, it's amazing how we are as humans. Here the other day, I was in the car with my two, son, two sons and, my two grand, and Mike's two boys. And we started talking about a situation, and we weren't talking in an attack way. We weren't, you know, gossiping or, or you know, making fun of or, you know, scorning or ridiculing. We were just talking about a situation and the way it was and the way it had been. And it wasn't a, a good situation concerning this person. So I, I get home, I go to bed, wake up the next morning, sit down with the Lord, and immediately, and I've had him do this to me more than once, what about what you said last night? And, of course, you, you're, you immediately start thinking how you're going to defend yourself. But when he brings it up, there's no defense. And I said, you know what, Lord, you're absolutely right. And here's what he said to me. He said, all of that talk last night, he said, I didn't hear you praying for that person one time. I didn't hear you blessing them or praying for them one time. And I said, you're absolutely right, Lord. You've taught me to do that. And I didn't do it. I repent. And then I called, I, I texted my grandsons and texted my two sons, and I said, I want to repent to you for last night. I shouldn't have been saying what I was saying, and the Lord convicted me, and I just want you to know I apologize and I repent. Because I don't want them to pick up the wrong thing from me. Well, Grandpa does that, or Dad did that. Amen? And so, uh, you know, I remember Brother Hagin telling the story how that he was in a minister's meeting one time, and this one preacher had fa fallen into immorality and ran off, I think, with his secretary or his piano player or something. And these other preachers were criticizing this guy. And he said, I, I didn't say anything. He said, I knew better than to attack somebody like that. And he said that finally one of them said, well, I don't even think that really happened, did it? And one of the men said, yes, it did. It did happen, Brother Hagin, didn't it? He did take off, didn't he? And Brother Hagin said, you know, I knew he did. So I just said, well, yeah, he did, you know. And he said, that's all I said. He said, that night I went to bed turned the light off, and he said, as soon as I turned the light off, the whole room lit up like it, the light wasn't off. And he said, I heard an audible voice, God's audible voice, say this. He quoted a scripture to me. The word of God is the sword, isn't it? He said, who are you to judge another man's servant? Who are you to judge another man's servant? See, we're God's servants. We're to serve one another, but we're not, you're not my master, I'm not your master. And he said, well, Lord, Lord, I didn't attack. I did I, He started doing, you know, the, and he said, God wouldn't, he said, God just kept saying the same thing over. And he said, finally, I said, okay, Lord, okay. I apologize. I'm sorry. I repent. And then he said, he heard the Lord say this, for all you know, you wouldn't have done as well as he did if you'd have been under the same pressure. So uh, we've got to watch it. 
And see, why did the Lord conf confront him about that? Because we're told not to give place to the devil. We think we can get away with that, but if, if we, <laughs> we open the door to the enemy, he's in. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever talk about anything negative, you know, or you can't ever, you know, address a situation. There's a time, you know, the Bible tells us, if we see our brother sin, we're, we're to go to him and exhort him not to do that and to, to do what's right. Amen? But there's a difference in that and using the sword in a wrong way. The Bible says if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So if I'm using my sword wrongly, the enemy is going to be able to use it against me. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. It's true. It's true. You know, in a time of war, you, the rules just change, my friend. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they do, but they don't and they, in a way. But when you get in a wartime scenario, you don't have time to run around and do things that civilians can do. You can't get away with that. You get yourself killed. Yeah. Yeah. The enemy means business. Christians think, oh, I can walk outside of the love of God. I don't have, I don't know wh where they get that idea. <coughs> that they can live outside of love and not be vulnerable to the enemy. When you refuse to live in agape love and be a, a live with a servant's heart toward God and love people and forgive people and do it because it's the right thing to do from an intended heart, not from some wound, you know, emotional feeling. If you wait until that happens, you'll never do it. You'll be talking about something that Aunt Maisie did to you 60 years ago. Yeah. Well, I forgave her. No, you didn't. You wouldn't be talking about it if you did. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember I had a lady one time in the church. Somebody had done something two or four years before or whatever. You know? But I, I, I've, I've forgiven her. I just, no, you haven't. Why are you still talking about it? Right. It wouldn't be an issue. The only time I talk about stuff like that is if I'm using it in an illustrative way to illustrate something. Amen? You know, well, hallelujah. The way we see the world is not totally right. Not everybody's going to see it the way you see it all the time. Amen? Praise God. All right, let me move on before I get in real trouble. Sword of the Spirit. Turn over to Isaiah 49. I like this one. Isaiah 49. <laughs> keep wielding the sword. What's he saying? He's saying keep prophesying. Keep decreeing. Keep saying what I'm saying. That's what Jesus was doing when he got up and preached at his own home church. Brother Hagin had an appearance of, of Jesus uh, for an hour and a half one time, and the Lord taught him about the prophetic ministry because there wasn't much in understanding about that in those days. And he, The Lord had called him to that ministry, and so he was explaining certain things to him. And one of the things he said the Lord told him was, everywhere I went to preach on, while I was on earth, I quoted Isaiah 61 before I preached. What was he doing? He was decreeing the season. If you read those scriptures there that he, in Luke 4, where he decreed the spirit of the Lord's upon me because he's anointed me, he was decreeing about a person, but then the bottom of it was the, the acceptable, to decree the acceptable year of the Lord, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He was decreeing a spiritual season, and he was that person for that season, and they could enter in and receive all that was in that jubilee season for them if they would accept that it was the season and that he was the, the Messiah. Amen? Amen? Praise God. So he's telling us, keep using the sword. Because as, as I continue to say what God's saying about my family, he gave me Psalm 112, that's a great psalm for your family. Great psalm for your family. You need to read it, meditate on it. He gave that to me uh, several years back. And any time the spirit of fear approaches me about my grandchildren or something in my family, immediately the Holy Spirit quickens my mind to Psalm 112, and I go back and I read it, and I read it in the devil's face on yeah. purpose. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, devil, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Here's 
what the Holy Ghost has said about my family. Let me just read it to you. I like what Brother Hagin used to say. He said, let me read it to you in case you can't read. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. So keep decreeing. Keep wielding the sword. The enemy starts bringing his sword against your mind. He starts attacking your mind. He starts shooting arrows at you. Bitter words, accusations, whether it comes through people or it just comes into your thought life every day. Amen. Then pick up the sword and fight back. Keep wielding the sword. Praise God. So here in, uh, I, what did I say, Isaiah 49. This is the prophet here. Oh, I never did finish what I was saying about the prophets. The devil's always after the prophetic word of the Lord. It's not about the prophet as a person. It's about the prophetic word of the Lord. Right. Now listen, under the new covenant, you have a prophetic anointing on your life. I didn't say you were called to the office of prophet. There is a office, a ministry office of prophet that people are called to and stand in. But there's a prophetic mantle over the whole body of Christ. Why? Because we have the spirit of prophecy in us. The Bible says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Amen. You and I can yield to the Holy Spirit and begin to just talk about Jesus, and that is a prophetic flow. The Bible encourages us to prophesy, that we're to seek to prophesy. The, uh, the Bible tells us that, you know, that we, we can do these things. We can move in that prophetic utterance, spirit-inspired words. Amen. The Bible even says, and this is one that really zings you, it says that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet under the Old Covenant before people were born again, before they had the spirit of prophecy in them. They would have the spirit of prophecy come on them, upon them to, to anoint them to move in certain things. It says John the Baptist was the greatest prophet under the Old Covenant, and he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. We don't realize the place we've been given, the things that are available to us. We look back at Moses. I don't know about you, but man, I, I read some things about what happened with Moses. That blows my mind. It's like, wow. And yet over in the Old Covenant, or in the New Covenant, in Paul's writings, he says that glory wasn't anything compared to the glory that should be in us. Yeah. The glorious church in its fullness is going to be something wild. So the devil's always after the prophetic word. Why? Because Amos chapter 3 is a good place to read about it. Because the Bible says over there, the Lord will do nothing in the earth, but first he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Yeah. And then the verse after that says, the lion has roared. Who can but fear, cause and effect. He's actually making a case of cause and effect there, the things that don't happen in the earth. There's a cause and there's an effect. The lion has roared. That's the cause. The effect is, who will not fear? People will fear when they hear the roar of the lion. The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? He's saying God's going to speak, and when you release that prophetic word, it's, it causes and it has an effect in the earth. The devil wants, to, wants you to take your sword and put it back in your scabbard. He, wants, he doesn't want you to pull that sword out and just release the power and the anointing and the decrees of the Lord. Even singing a song under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost clears the air of the demonic. Amen. Just praising God under that prophetic anointing and mantle in your life. When you put on by faith the garment of praise... Everything changes. Every demonic spirit that's oppressing your mind or coming against you will flee. When the lights turn on, darkness flees. That's how powerful you are. Amen? Glory to God. So the enemy is always after the prophets. He's always after the prophetic voice. He raises stupid doctrines up in the church. Well, we don't prophesy anymore. That's the Old Testament. It's not true. Why does the Bible say that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher will be here until everything's completed. Right. See, he wants to shut your mouth. He wants you, doesn't want you to think that God can use you to decree a thing and it'll be established right. or to wield the sword. So here's one of God's prophets, Isaiah. I love reading Isaiah. He 
He's a tremendous blessing. There are things actually in his book that even haven't come to pass yet even. But look at verse 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, you people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb of, from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And that's true of you too, you know. And he hath, now here it is, I like this. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Who is Isaiah? He had a prophetic anointing on his life. He had a prophetic mantle, prophetic anointing. Yeah. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. And made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. See, God protects people. He hides you. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, the overshadowing, the covering. God's got, I'm like a sword in his hand. He puts me in the quiver. He puts me, he hides me like an arrow in a quiver or a sword in his scabbard. I'm his sword. He, he takes, you know, his anointing, his calling on my life. He guards me. He takes care of me. But he uses me, praise God, like a, like a, a sword. He uses me as a sword in the spirit in this prophetic mantle. Amen? I love it too. It blesses me. Now, you know, verse 2 here, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Equate that in the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. It says, put on the helmet of salvation, protect your mind. Always think salvation thoughts. Because that's who Jesus was. God wanted us to know who Jesus was so much he named him salvation. What he came to do, and when salvation means complete freedom, period. Amen? The blood has set you free. You are free. Amen? Put on the helmet of salvation. Don't let the enemy come in and war a warfare against your mind. Tell him to shut up and replace those thoughts with the word of God. And then it says, and take the sword of the spirit, which are the speakings of God. Use that sword out of your mouth. Equate that together here with verse 2 here. He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. I want you to get this tonight. I want you to walk around Madeira all this week seeing a big old sword sticking out of your mouth. I want you to understand this is the way it is. I want you to know that the enemy is intimidated by the fact that you might use your sword in this year of the the clashing of swords. In this year of the king's sword, the king has pulled out his sword and he has come this year through you to take over, to take back what belongs to him. That's why we need to look at our institutions, look at our family, look at people and say, Holy Spirit, how do you see them? What do you say about them? That's why he corrected me the other day. What are you doing getting in agreement with what the devil's done in that person's life and is doing right now? Don't use your sword against them. The enemy's already got enough people criticizing them and got them deceived. Why don't you start saying what I say about them? Why don't you start praying what I want you to pray about them and decree over them? And treat them like it's true. Because it is true. Amen? Praise God. Let me wind this up tonight with some examples with some examples of uh, the Holy Spirit's sword in operation. Look at your neighbor and say, I want you to wield the sword all this week. No, tell them this. I command you to wield the sword all this week. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. I'm serious about this. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. You're probably not too familiar with that area of Scripture, but... If you're, a, if you're a Pentecostal charismaniac, you got it. You know what that one's about. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I, I, I don't care if they think I'm crazy. Let them think I'm crazy. Yeah. You know when the, if you study church history, you know when we lost the fire of God in the Pentecostal church? When people wanted to be respectable. When we started making that shift of we want people to like us. Anyway, it's not that we go out and be a bunch of, you know, rude, crude people. 
But uh, we got to please, like Karen was saying, or somebody was saying this morning, we got to please God and not man. Verse 1 in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. By the way, the day of Pentecost is coming up here shortly, in a week or two, isn't it? They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. God released his voice, his breath, his voice. It filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to what? Wield the sword. They began to wield the sword. They yielded to the Holy Ghost, and they, the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. He used their tongue, their mouth, their voice box, their spirit. But they did the speaking. He gave them the utterance. He gave them the power. But they had to do the speaking. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And you know the rest of the story. How once it was explained and once Peter stood up and used his anointing and the sword of the Spirit in his life to, to preach and proclaim the truth of what was happening there that day, 3,000 people were taken out of. There's a warfare that happened there with the sword of the Spirit that pushed darkness back out of 3,000 lives and people came into the kingdom of God that day. 3,000 people because somebody, 120 people, used the sword. See, when you find something, the first mention of something in the Bible, there's a, a biblical uh, interpretation rule. I, forget what they, I think it's the law of first mention, actually, yeah. is what they call it. That that's, God is setting a precedent. He's saying, this is how this works. Don't take it and go somewhere else with it. it it's always a precedent for down the road. This is the way it started, and this is the way it's going to end. You know, John G. Lake was a mighty man of God, used in a mighty and powerful way, used in South Africa, affected South Africa in, in a tremendous way, affected our nation. He used to live in Tacoma, Washington. At one point, the government decreed that uh, Tacoma, Washington was the healthiest city in the United States because he had such a strong healing anointing. But he said at one time he was just concerned about the condition of the church and was praying for the church. And he couldn't sleep, and he walked out into this park late one night, had his Bible with him, was just praying. He said this, this tall man started approaching him, walked up to him, and he said, I looked at him, and I realized he was an angel. And he said the angel began to talk to him about his concerns. And he said, then the angel reached out and took my Bible out of my hand and turned over to Acts chapter 2. And he said this, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and, and this, he said, this and this alone is what will satisfy the heart of man. There's nothing else that will satisfy human beings. They were created for the glory of God to live in this. And so he said, teach them about this. Point them in this direction. Because when they open up to the Holy Spirit and are filled with the Holy Spirit, see, we were made to be vessels of honor and glory. Yeah. His glory. Yeah. We were made for the glory of God. That's why nobody, and people have searched for all the time humans have been on this earth, and have not found the answer because we were made to live in his glory. It says in Psalm chapter 8 that God surrounded or crowned man in honor and glory. Yeah. Mankind. And Jesus said, I'm coming back for the glorious church. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yielding to the glory. Letting the glory flow through us. Yeah. You know why we got that word glory up there? Because God told me to put that up there. He said, I want my people glory-minded. I want them glory-minded. Over in Romans 8, it says, he, I have glorified you. I want you to go from one degree of glory to the next. I want you to yield to the Holy Ghost. I want you to hunger for spiritual manifestations. I want you to desire to be used of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And see, what I'm talking about in using this sword, you don't have to be wild-eyed and your hair flapping back and your ears flapping back. You can be singing Jesus loves me under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and winning a battle. God can have you go sing something over somebody's life and it drives demons nuts and drives them off. It's a sword. Hallelujah. I wasn't wanting to go over there, but I'm going to have to. Turn over to Ephesians. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 5. 
He's talking about us walking in love. He's talking about us not walking in darkness. Verse 8 says, For you were sometime in darkness, but now you're light. That word light, phos, means in the, in the uh, Greek means never kindled, never, therefore never quenched. He says, Now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then he goes on to talk about some things on how to do that. <clears throat> and then it talks about that the, the light will always reprove or expose the darkness. Verse 13, but all things that are reproved, reproved are made manifest. That word made manifest means to take the lid off. Are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly. That, word, that means seeing all around, clear vision. Not as fools, but as wise redeeming the kairos, redeeming the time because the days are evil. If you just let days happen, even though you're born again and headed for heaven, the days have been touched with sin. This world has been touched with sin and the devil will pervert the, the kairos and the purpose of God in the season and have you thinking thoughts that are just natural human thoughts, carnal thoughts, and you'll miss the whole point of why you're alive and what you're supposed to do and what God will do through you. See, that's what this is about tonight, is to remind you, you're in a Kairos season to wield the sword, to use the sword, keep using the sword, keep speaking, keep listening to the Holy Ghost. He's taking ground and he wants to take it through you. He wants you to enter into that priesthood that, that you've been put into in Christ Jesus. You, the Bible says in Revelation, we are kings and priests under our God. He is, uh, according to the, to the order of Melchizedek, he's a king and a priest. We are as well. We're one with him. He wants us to flow with him. Amen. Amen. So he says, redeem the time. Praise God. For the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise? How do I redeem the time, Lord? How do I? It says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's the start, finding out what he has to say about it. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, natural wine, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, get over into the Spirit. Just get over and start praising Him. See, there's times when psalms will just rise up out of you, singing to the Lord. And it's not just for sweet communion between you and He. That's wonderful but you are releasing into the atmosphere the sword of the Lord. I remember one time we were in the prayer room on a Sunday night, and the devil had just been attacking me in my mind. He had been coming against me, and it, and it wasn't a, so much a thing where he's controlling my thoughts, but I just felt this oppressive pressure. And Priscilla Huerta came in with the praise group. They were praying before service. And she walked over and she, or actually Norma before that had said, Pastor, I feel like we're supposed to pray for you. So they prayed for me. And she walked over and she says, Pastor, I feel like I'm supposed to sing this song over you. And I said, well, sing it. And she just started singing this sweet little song over me. And when she did that, that whole thing lifted off of me. In Branson, Missouri, I was being attacked. Back when I was going through that thing in 2000 with that post-traumatic thing, I was being attacked all the way there. I mean, I was fighting anxiety fighting an attack against my mind just to go to that meeting. Yeah. I walked in the building and LaDonna, whatever her last name is, she's an anointed violinist. She was on the platform just playing her violin. I walked in the room and it was like, <laughs> that whole thing the enemy was doing against me just left. And the peace and the presence of God just came on me. We have no idea, singing the song of the Lord, how powerful it is. It's wielding a sword. He's telling us, this is how you save the day. Redeem the time. Save the day. The devil, you, you don't have to let the devil use every day for what he wants to do and his deception and what he wants to do. If you'll watch and pray, he'll show you. He'll bring one of your grandkids up before you and he'll show you what the devil's trying to do in that child's life. Yeah. God will show you what he wants to do with that child's life if you'll ask him. So you can pray with knowledge. Yeah. But the, he'll show you what the devil's trying to do. Yeah. So that you can say, no, you're not. 
That's my seed. They're under my realm of authority. Come on. Psalm 112 says that your seed will be mighty spiritual warriors in the earth. I forbid my grandkids, my grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids, if there are those, before Jesus comes. I forbid them to be anything but mighty warriors on the earth. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, in Acts 2, we saw the operation of the sword of the Spirit. I won't have you turn there, but in Acts 3, Peter and John were going up to the gate beautiful, the timely gate. Peter looked at this crippled man that I'm sure he'd seen many times. And all of a sudden, the sword started coming up out of Peter's mouth. He said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I give it to you right now. And he decreed a thing, and the man was healed. And of course, you know they got in trouble for that. And so they went to their own company, their own congregation. You need your own company. You need your own church. This nonsense of we don't need church anymore is exactly that, nonsense. I won't get into that. That's a whole long, big thing. So they went to their own congregation over there in, in Acts chapter 4, and they told them what was going on, and it says that the church lifted up their voice in one accord and said, and they begin to quote Psalm. I think it's Psalm, the second Psalm, if I remember. Lord, why do the heathen rage? And what happened? God put a corporate, a sword in a corporate group of people, and they begin to decree, they begin to pray, they begin to proclaim, they begin to petition, and what happened? Instead of the devil putting a pall and a covering of fear and intimidation over that, God took that whole thing to a higher level. He responded by moving it to where more signs and wonders were happening, more people were getting saved, greater things were happening. Yeah. We don't have to take it. That's right. We can give it as well as take it. Amen? Yeah. And then over in chapter 5, where the devil was trying to invade the move of God with sin, Ananias and Sapphira. Peter was up there in that apostolic office, that governing office, and Ananias and Sapphira walked in the door, and the sword of God got in his mouth. And he said, you, you haven't lied to men, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. Now here's the judgment. It wasn't Peter saying, well, I'm going to get you, man, you have ticked me off. It was God saying, I will not allow what I'm doing here to be pen penetrated with evil <clears throat> because it'll hinder what I'm wanting to do. You know, this is a side of revival we don't understand yet. It said when Noah obeyed God, he not only launched the world into a new day, but it says he judged the world. See, because you and I obey God in, in Madeira, Great blessings come in the Madeira, but judgment's going to come to people who won't play the, uh, with God, or won't go with God, I should say. Play it God's way. Whole nother thing, that's for him to decide. In chapter 12, they prayed for Peter, Peter when he was in prison, the king intending to destroy him and kill him like he had James. They pulled out the sword of the Spirit and began to do warfare on his behalf, began to pray, and you know the story how the angel came and let him loose. In Acts chapter 16, the damsel with the spirit of divination. Many people believe that was the oracle of Delphi. It was a total demonic cult where they, they uh, would prophesy under demon power about people's life and all that kind of thing. And Paul was over there moving and ministering, and this demon was in, intimidated by Paul. He knew Paul was the real deal because he kept talking, saying nice things about Paul. These men are the servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. See, what was that demon doing? He was trying to stay hid. He was hoping Paul would think that was the Holy Ghost talking through that girl. Right. And Paul didn't pick up on it right away because it says, after many days, Paul being grieved. Yeah. See, learn to go by the Holy Spirit in you. Right. Yes. Brother Hagin used to say it this way. He said, sometimes it's just like washing your feet with your socks on. You know something's just not right. Yes. Yes. Amen? After many days being grieved, said to the spirit, come out of her. And she got free, and they got in trouble, and then they had a revival, and a whole lot of shaking going on at the jailhouse. Amen? Praise God. But Paul used the sword as the spirit of God prompted him. And lastly, let's turn over this one scripture, and then we'll close. Yes? Okay. Psalm 149. 
Psalm 149. Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Let him sing through you. And his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He takes pleasure in you. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud in their beds. Now here it is, verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Remember Jehoshaphat and Judah? God says, you're outnumbered, you're outmanned, you're outgunned. They came to God and said, what do we do? He said, don't worry about it. I'm going to fight for you. You won't even have to fight. Just show up at the battle and put the choir in front and all of you go forward praising me for he is good, praising the beauty of holiness for he is good and his mercies endure forever. He hasn't changed. No matter, no matter, no matter how many people, demonic inspired people show up, he hasn't changed. And so they went forward praising him, the sword of the spirit in their mouth which activated the, activated the angelic realm. Yes. And angels invaded the, the demons that were over those, those armies and caused such confusion in the demonic realm that the people that were under the influence of the demons got confused and killed each other. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Elisha inherited an army of angels when Elijah left. We see it in his life where the enemy army surrounded him because he was giving away secrets to the king of Israel. And, you know, they surrounded him. We're going to get him. The servant went out to get water in the morning, see, saw all this army surrounding the city. What are we going to do? He said, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see the real truth in the spirit realm. And there were chariots of fire and horses. More. And he said, there's more with us than there are with them. They don't have us cornered. We got them cornered. God blinded their eyes. You know the story. And then later on, they came back. I guess they didn't get enough the first time. They came back and surrounded Samaria because they were trying to get Josh, trying to get uh, uh, Elisha. He's in the city. There's, the people are starting to starve. He's waiting for the king to humble himself enough. God's waiting for the king to humble himself enough to just come to the prophet. And finally he did, even though it was with evil intentions. And the word of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, came out of the prophet's mouth. And he said, by this time tomorrow, there's going to be an abundance of food, and it's going to be sold for this much. Amen. And one of the king's officers says, if God opened the windows of heaven and poured out rain right now, uh, that, that couldn't happen by tomorrow. Right. Well, what he didn't understand is God has more ways of getting food to you than uh, the normal process of growing a crop. Yeah. And he said, because you won't believe the word of the Lord, you're going to see it, but you won't get any of it. And the guy didn't. He got trampled to death at the gate trying to control the crowd. When you've got a hungry crowd on your hands, get out of the way. Amen? But what happened? Four lepers sitting in the gate. Sitting in that little space from the outer gate and the, to the inner gate. Right in here. No man's land. The people inside would have stoned them to death if they would have went inside. The enemy's out here and they're bent on killing everybody in the place. So finally they got this spiritual revelation they didn't know was a spiritual revelation. They said, why are we sitting here dying a slow death of starvation? Let's go out to the enemy and if they kill us we're going to die anyway. But if they don't, whatever. So they got up and four lepers started acting on the prophecy that, jo that uh, Elisha had given, didn't even know he'd given it. Started going toward the enemy. And when they did, it said that the armies out there heard the sound of chariots and horses. What chariots and horses? The chariots and horses that were with Elisha, his angel army that was with him to work with him. When somebody started acting on that prophecy, the angels started moving, army of angels. God let these enemies hear them. They became confused and fled. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you see how this works together? How the sword of God in our mouth? And it says here that when we praise God, the high praises of God, we go up to where he's at. <clears throat> we begin to exalt who he is and what he has. It says that it's like putting a sword in our hand. Yes. And it says what will happen is, verse 7, we'll execute vengeance upon the heathen, 
punishments upon the people and their kings, these demonic spirits and, and these princes and nobles that are ruling over them in the spirit realm, they'll be bound. Their kings will be bound with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. And it says to execute upon them the judgment written. You see, the word is a freedom word to us. It's a judgment written against the enemy in his kingdom. And that's why when Jesus said it is written, the enemy had to obey it. This honor have all his saints. You see, binding and loosing wasn't something that popped up when Peter, uh, Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter gave the right answer, and he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, and you, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose. Right here it says, hallelujah, that if we will do this, verse 8, it will bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Do you see what I'm saying tonight? Sword in your mouth. Praise in your mouth. Walking around just, Lord, I just thank you for who you are in my life. I give you glory. I welcome you. Your word says you come and you enthrone yourself as king in my praises. And I want you in me and around me. I want you moving in my neighborhood. I want you to move in my business, my life, my family. See, it's up to us. The enemy just wants to shift us and get us praising him. Did you hear how bad it is now? I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, my God. Aunt Lucy died of that disease. I, I think I'm getting it. Whatever. Get out of that. Don't start praising the devil. I'm not saying don't live in reality or acknowledge things that are true naturally but just because something's naturally true doesn't mean it's spiritually true yeah. doesn't mean that it's eternal truth there's temporal truth and there's eternal truth and if we'll take eternal truth and we'll let the lord bring the sword forth out of our mouth things will change yes. amen. we're on our way to complete absolute victory and i'm not backing up amen what do you have, Tammy? Yes. Instead of the defense, yes. they would take their intercession right into those places found by injustice and hit by evil. Amen. I believe people sitting in this place tonight are strikers. Amen. Amen. Holy. Amen. You're part of the air force of the Lord. Amen. I'm fighting the support, like it says here, for the ground truth. Amen. So That's right. That's right. Amen. That's a good word. Amen. Use the sword. The sword is the offensive weapon. You know, years and years ago, we had a lady in the church. Her husband was paralyzed from the neck down. She didn't have money, so she had to be with him almost 24-7. And uh, she was a woman of prayer. And one day, we were having service, and I just I looked at her. And I, when I looked at her, I heard the Holy Spirit say inside me, he said, tell her she has a worldwide ministry on her knees at home. That because she prays, she goes out, her effectiveness goes out into the world, and God uses her around the world to change things. Don't limit yourself to some natural thing. God's put something in your mouth that can affect nations. And like Tammy said, that's true. We're strikers. We're Gideon's army. We're not people sitting at home in the tent saying, well, I sure hope this works. God had to get rid of all those people. He knew that they would infect the 300 and mess them up. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So get on the offense. Begin to decree a thing. If you're like me, you say the wrong thing in front of your kids, repent. Because <laughs> we do make mistakes. We get in the flesh. Amen? But that doesn't mean we have to live there. Let's stand.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Does this help you tonight? I believe this is a prophetic word for us. One last thing. This is another thing the Lord's been, I'm glad he reminded me of this because I almost missed it. This church is a hospital. This church is a place of healing. This fellowship was intended. It's, it's the two primary functions of this church are prayer and healing. Those are two of the, of the main focuses. And out of the prayer and out of the healing and the restoration comes flourishing and blessing and God, just God's goodness. I want you to begin to decree with me when you think about this church and our meetings that this place, just begin to say this is a hospital. People come here. People that are sick come here. And I'm not just talking about physically sick. I'm talking about people that need to be healed emotionally. People, marriages that need to be healed. Businesses that need to be healed. Whatever it is. We need to begin to decree that this is a hospital and that the angels of God and the people of God in this church are bringing people here to be healed. And when they come here, they get healed. We need, God's just been showing me, we need to take on a corporate mantle for this meeting or for this church and begin to say what's happening here. Because now is the time and the season for this church to grow numerically. Amen. Amen. But you and I need to come into one accord. Just like Paul told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he, says, he said that they were to say the same thing. Right. We need to find out what God's saying about us. He told me I was down in Hanford sitting at the ice cream place. Hallelujah. <laughs> eat, the, eat the sweet, drink the fat, or what is it? Eat the fat and drink the sweet. Anyway, I'm sitting there looking across the street, and I looked at the library, and God says, your church is not a library. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's a hospital. And he began to talk to me and show me. He says, you need to start saying and get the people to say, this place is a hospital. Yes. Amen? Amen? And people come here to get healed and blessed and helped. Praise God. And you've got a big place in that. Amen? Well, as we leave, leave tonight, we want to pray for uh, Andy, someone named Andy, having surgery this week. They're removing, removing part of his liver because of cancer. He's not sure, uh, something the doctor's not sure he can get all the tumors. So I want to pray for him. For a 14-year-old named Noah, who has, is having cancer treatments, has been really sick. And Tom, uh, diagnosed with cirrhosis and retaining fluid. He's not a believer. I've heard more reports in the last couple of weeks of cancer than anything else. And so, Father, in, a, in the name of Jesus, right now, we come before you, we approach your throne, and we thank you that you have given us victory over cancer. God, we pray for these people right here on these pieces of paper. We pray for all those others, Lord, that we've already been standing with and praying for, and we come against cancer. And, Father, I thank you that you demonstrate the victory over cancer. Cancer, we address you directly. In the name of Jesus. The name of cancer cannot even approach the name of Jesus. And so we replace the name cancer with the name Jesus. And we say Jesus to your liver. We say Jesus on your body. And in Jesus' name, we proclaim freedom and health and healing. Lord, I thank you that the angels are going forth right now. And I thank you that people are being saved and delivered. God, we say that this church whether it's through the online ministry or it's in our services or on the streets or in the food ministry or in the different uh, ministries of, of the women's and men's ministry. God, everything that you direct us to do, we thank you that healing flows forth in the name of Jesus. And we say our scripture is how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and the Believer's Church of Madeira who went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil. We praise you and we thank you for healing, Lord. Let it be the dinner bell to salvation in our community, in Jesus' name. And Lord, let it flow in the other fellowships. <clears throat> let it flow out to them and bless them and help them as well. And we thank you for it. Now, Lord, we intend on con continuing to wield the sword. Put your words in our mouth this week, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Have a great week. Be blessed and use that sword.